This live presentation was produced in Ashland, Oregon by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. RVML relies on the support of our volunteers, members, and donors to organize and present these programs. For more information about this presentation or to borrow, download, or purchase other recordings from our catalog, please visit our website at rvml.org. So welcome everyone. For the two new people, I wanted to mention too, there's a sign-up sheet for an email uh, contact list if you're interested in that. Um, and for everyone, someplace here I have a clipboard. If any of you, by the break, decide you'd like to be on my mailing list, you can sign up on the clipboard here for that. So, well, we're talking about astrology. I have a very Venusian chart. And for those of you who might know anything about that, I'm, that means I'm very relationship oriented and I like to make a personal connection with people, which is why I like to have people closer and let it feel more personal and informal. And so always my speaking style is fairly informal and especially tonight since um, it's a last minute fill in for someone who couldn't come. Um, I didn't come prepared with a polished talk as much as I came prepared to share some basic ideas about astrology, and then see where your interests are. Um, because I have no idea how much or how little you know about astrology, so I don't know really at what level to direct it. In fact, maybe I'll just start there. How many people uh, have had your individual horoscopes done? Okay, most people have. How many people, um, in addition to having your individual chart done, feel like you have a pretty good working knowledge of the ABCs of astrology? Or did it all sound like Greek? <laughs> oh, good, then I can, <laughs> I can feel confident I can shed some light then. <laughs> so um, I'll just tell you how I got introduced to astrology. I was interested in it as a kid. I grew up in a little town in Iowa and we had a Woolworths dime store. And for a nickel, you could go and put your nickel in this machine and get a little scroll. Anyone, remember, anyone in my generation remember those little printouts? <laughs> so I would always get one every month for Taurus, which is my sign, and for Virgo, which was my boyfriend. So I, <laughs> I became an early expert on, the <laughs> on a Taurus and Virgo initially. And then, you know, the interest in astrology kind of receded into the background. I went to college at Iowa State University, and the interesting thing about that is the main un student union at Iowa State, when you walk in, there's an entry that's kind of a rotunda, and on the middle of the floor is a huge bronze um, horoscope. And the tradition was you didn't step on it, so everyone would walk around it. And I never did find out how Iowa State University, this conservative farm school, <laughs> came to have a horoscope in the middle of it, but there it was. And if any of you have traveled in Europe, you may have noticed that cathedrals have astrological symbolism on them, which is kind of intriguing. We might talk about that a little later. So astrology has actually had a quite strong and interwoven history, even here in the West, but from the age of the Enlightenment on, it really fell into disrepute. And so even today, uh, mainstream astrology, of course, is not taught in the universities and um, conservative um, fundamentalists still consider it the work of the devil. Um, so it's got kind of a spattered history. But at the turn of the century, the beginning of the 20th century, it started to be reintroduced into the West and it started to be reintroduced with more of a psychological orientation. So that as Freud and Jung were working, um, whereas if you look at Vedic astrology or the really old astrological text, it's much more about predicting um, events, a lot of emphasis on that, whereas modern uh, Western astrology has really grown up in tandem with a psychological <coughs> orientation in many ways. And certainly in terms of my own reintroduction to astrology, um, was it a major turning point in my life? I didn't realize it until in retrospect, but how many people have heard of the Saturn return? Okay, 
The Saturn return is a key time in life. Um, I'll explain it more as I go over all the planets, but it happens roughly or somewhere between age 28, 29, 30. And so it corresponds to the crisis of realizing that your youth is over, that you're now really, truly an adult. <laughs> and people tend to make some major life choices at the time of a Saturn return. And so at the time I was having a Saturn return, of course, I didn't know it at the time because I wasn't you know, versed in astrology at that point, but I was about to be introduced to it. I went through a major change. I had been working in the business world and I resigned my job and um, signed up for the Matthew Fox Creation Centered Spirituality Program, uh, motivated largely by an interest in Jungian psychology. And while I was at this program, one of my classmates was a woman named Barbara Han Clow. And if any of you are astrologers, um, Barbara Han Clow is a published astrologer and also a big into past life regression and all sorts of far out Aquarian things. She is an Aquarius. And so she was a friend of mine and she offered to do my chart for free, so you know, you couldn't turn that down. And I was so struck by what she knew about me even though she didn't know me well or for very long, she knew things about me that people who had known me for a long time wouldn't have guessed. <laughs> so that got my interest. And I was kind of on a sabbatical year, you know, studying Christian mysticism and all sorts of new things. And so I threw astrology into the mix of what I started to study. But because I was studying Jungian psychology and Christian mysticism at the same time, it kind of colored my interest in astrology. So my particular forte as an astrologer, I've been doing charts professionally for people since a few years after that, um, is in really helping a person understand their soul's journey, their personality, strengths and weaknesses and issues and challenges. And um, it's very much geared towards that way. I've had a lifelong interest in spirituality and, and the journey towards wholeness. Um, and so astrology can be used in many ways for predictions, for understanding social trends, for, for health, um, for business, all sorts of specialties that you can get. And most of those other areas are not my forte. But when it comes to the individual journey and relationship issues, those are the the two um, that I've really spent most of my time studying. Um, so, okay, I was going to start with um, Does everyone know what a basic chart looks like? Have you all seen a horoscope? Let's see if I can draw and be hooked up to this at the same time. I did bring some horoscopes with me. Okay, so but a mandala is an Eastern term that represents a picture that's within a circle and it represents wholeness. And so that's what an astrology chart is. It's certainly, it's a mandala of wholeness is one way of looking at it. So a, a, a chart, when you look at it is, you know what I think I'll do is, for those of you who haven't seen one, I'll, I'll pass out some samples. You have to give these back because these are charts of clients of mine. <laughs> I brought charts of people that didn't live locally so that you won't be seeing charts of people you know. <laughs> but pass those. Who else wants to look at a chart just to see what one looks like? You want to pass a couple back? <laughs> so it's a circle that's divided. Boy, my into 12 slices. Okay, I didn't do that right, did I, there? <laughs> so the first thing I want to say about astrology in terms of a symbolic language, one of the things I liked about it when I first, is astrology right away suggests how we're all alike, okay? Because we all have all the houses, all the signs, and all the planets and yet how they're placed and where they're placed is what shows how we're each unique. So I liked that about it right away, right off the, the top. 
So what planets are, well first, what everyone mostly knows about astrology, if you don't know anything else about, about it except for what you read in the newspapers, are the signs. So everyone knows the 12 signs of astrology, right? Does everyone here have at least a thumbnail sketch idea of your basic sign qualities? That's what people mostly know, okay? So, and that's very useful in terms of understanding some basic personality traits. How many do you understand that those 12 signs come from an interplay of four elements and three qualities? Are those things that you're familiar with? Okay. The four elements you might have heard of, and these are very universal qualities that you'll find in everything from indigenous cultures to quite advanced um, cultures east and west. They'll talk about the elements. Earth, air, fire, and water are the four elements. So most of you have probably heard, oh, Pisces is a water sign, Aries is a fire sign. When you know the elements and the symbolism associated with the element, you already begin to know something about the different signs. Okay, does that make sense? And the three qualities are associated, it's called the cardinal quality, the fixed quality, and the mutable quality. And the cardinal energy is what initiates so the first sign of the beginning of every season is a cardinal energy. It's what's initiating that. So on Thursday is the spring equinox, and that means we move into the sign Aries, the beginning of the cycle. So Aries is the cardinal fire sign. It's the initiating force, okay? And the fixed energy is a quality about steadfastness, holding on to something, following through on something, okay? That's the second sign of every season. Does that make sense? So the second sign in spring is Taurus, fixed earth, okay? And then the last sign of every season is what's called mutable. And mutable signs and energy is just what it sounds like. It's flexible, it's adaptable. So mutable people, their strength is that they're flexible, they're adaptable, they can fit in and, and um, to many different situations. The challenge is um, they don't have that initiating quality. So each quality has strengths and weaknesses. So by the time you get to the last sign of any season, that's the mutable quality, okay? So after Taurus calls, comes Gemini, Gemini would be mutable air, okay? So the mutable gets to be flexible and basically then yield, give way to the beginning of the next cardinal sign. So you have four elements, three qualities, three times four you come up with your 12 signs. So right away that already gives you a deeper look at the symbolism and some of the meanings that are behind those stereotypical qualities about the different signs. So for instance, if you take Aries, cardinal fire, fire is what? Let me, before I proceed here, part of why I think it's important to understand astrology as a symbolic language is because I think it's important to recover symbolic thinking as a whole in our culture. And this is something that Carl Jung talked a lot about. Uh, Jean Houston, if any of you were here and went to the Peace Conference and heard her speak, it's a basic part of her work, the recovery of the symbolic. That in the West, from the time of the Enlightenment, we have put such an emphasis on the rational, on the linear, on the sequential, on the logical. And we've lost the ability to understand symbolic thinking, which is what traditional and indigenous cultures were based in. So if you look at it in terms of an evolutionary development, it's like, okay, good, we went through that, we've developed the individual emphasis and the rational linear emphasis, and we can continue to have the fruits of that but now we can go back and synthesize it with that more right brain orientation of a symbolic understanding. 
And for me personally, when I studied astrology, that was part of the usefulness. I was actually a quite left brain person. That's what had been rewarded in the school system. And um, the fact that I could excel at it, I just went with it. So when I was introduced to astrology, you know, it keeps your left brain really busy. <laughs> you learn about the signs and the houses and the aspects and, you know, there's all sorts of data and information, some of which I'll share with you. But when it comes, if you look at this circle of information, you can know a lot of details about astrology. But when it comes to giving a good chart reading to someone, when it comes to giving a reading to an individual who comes to you, usually not just out of curiosity, usually because they're in some kind of crisis in their life, and they finally are so desperate, they're like, okay, I'll, I'll, even, I'll even try this, you know. Maybe that's not so true in Ashland, but I did most of my astrological work in Chicago, and it was pretty true there. <laughs> when people came to you for a reading, it was usually because they were in some kind of mess, and they were really looking for some kind of perspective. And so to make that leap between all the bits of information of what you can say about Pisces or Cancer or Scorpio and how you can look at an individual's chart, this inside look at the person's soul, at the, at the person's personal terrain and synthesize it in such a way that it's useful to them, you can only do that if you synthesize, which is a right brain, not a left brain activity. And so for me, it forced me to begin to bridge where I could rely on the left brain, but I had to start synthesizing and reaching the right brain. And astrology, you know, in the mainstream, why they ridicule it is because they only have that rational, logical, sequential way of looking at reality. And from that lens, how crazy is it to say that because you have Jupiter on your ascendant, you're going to be a very, you know, expansive, outgoing person? It's just like, what? It, it was it, like it doesn't compute. But once you begin to relate to astrology as an ancient symbolic system about energy, and we know even from modern physics that everything is energy. Everything's an expression, a manifestation of energy. Once you start looking at it symbolically, then a whole doorway opens up. Even beyond, and this is, uh, this is a, something else I liked about Jungian psychology as compared to mainstream psychology that I started out in. How many of you, when you've looked at a psychological, mainstream psychological texts, uh, end up feeling like, uh, almost like we're the sum total of our neuroses? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a sense almost of that we're so conditioned by our past, so conditioned by what happened to us in childhood that there's very little sense of hope or um, expansiveness. But one of the things that drew me to Jungian psychology is Jung said we're not only conditioned by our past, but we're called by our futures. And he would talk about this same term that Gene Houston used, entelechy. Entelechy means that there's an inherent potential in a, in a seed of a flower to grow into the full flower. So the entelechy, the potential is there in the beginning. And then there's a growth, there's a life force that calls it into being, calls it into expression. And in a certain sense, that's a way that you can look at the chart. The chart isn't showing, showing something fixed and static. It's showing a whole range of potentials that then the person takes a journey and has different of those potentials called into being by the different kinds of challenges they meet. Do you, do you get that? Mm -hmm. So it's a whole different, it's a much more opening, expansive kind of orientation. And usually when I would give a reading, I would say, you know, we'd look at this chart and I would say, your true self is in the center of this, kind of the center of the so circle, totally free and unimplicated by any of this. But your soul has taken birth at a particular time, at a particular place, 
and has this particular pattern of energy that you're then working with over your lifetime. Okay? Um, so that's kind of the basic symbolic understanding or approach towards the chart, the astrology chart or horoscope as a mandala of wholeness. Uh, are you all with me so far? I'm just kind of... <laughs> okay. Um, now, I'm going to just interject this. I don't know why I'm thinking of this, but, you know, I've been one of those people. I've been a sucker for, like, ways of understanding people. That's been my shtick. And so when I was introduced to Jungian psychology, I learned what was called the Myers-Briggs, all right, which is the whole, are you an introvert, an extrovert, those kind of things. So again, I learned astrology around that same time, and I really love all these things that help us gain insight and understanding into ourselves and, under, and other people. And one that I was introduced to some years back that I'm very passionate about now is called the Enneagram. People here familiar with the Enneagram? Okay, it was a whole nother, whole nother system, whole nother talk. I just want to say that for insight into personality patterns, I think the Enneagram's even better than astrology. And astrology's pretty darn good. <laughs> So, you know, those are both useful, and if you're curious, I can tell you about Enneagram another time. But, but the reason I say that is the thing about astrology that has the Enneagram beat hands down is that astrology shows what's moving at the moment. And those are what are called transits. If you've heard people talk about getting a reading, a lot of times what they're doing is not just looking at the birth chart, but they're hearing about what transits are happening. And that's where is the energy at now? And what is that likely to be bringing up in your life at this particular juncture? And that is incredibly useful. So that year by year, you see how the energy is shifting and moving. And you're given information and increased awareness to look a little deeper so that as things are happening in your life, you can be more conscious and more aware. And uh, I love giving people readings about transits because it, it helps people trust where they're at in their own life process. You know, I've had people, like I'm thinking of a woman that came to me and her husband had died, I, I don't know, like two and a half years previously and she was still really lost in a grief process and she said, all my friends tell me I should be over it and even my counselor is saying, you know, she doesn't know why this is taking so long. But I looked at her chart and I saw that she had these major Pluto transits going on and I was like, yeah, okay, it's just, you know, this is what's happening for you, you can expect it to go on for this much longer. And it like, it helps people have that extra sense of trusting where they're at. Do you, do you see that? So that's another incredibly useful thing about astrology. Um, so I'm going to come back now to the kind of the, what I call the ABCs of astrology, the basic nuts and bolts of, um, of this symbolic language. So I made the statement that one of the ways we're all alike is we all have all the planets. So in a chart, the sun will be placed someplace, the moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, all the planets will fall someplace within the circle, and they'll be in different signs. Those planets are symbolic of different needs or drives we all have as a human being. So this is, again, if you just think in literal terms about Jupiter as a body influencing you in a certain way, it can seem strange. But when you realize that it's symbolic of needs and drives that we have, you start to get onto the, onto, um, the value of symbolism. So right away, think about the solar system. What is the sun in the solar system? It's the center, right? It's the center of the solar system around which everything else revolves. And that's the role the sun plays in the individual chart. So that that's why everyone, when you say I'm a Pisces or I'm a Scorpio, what you're referring to is your sun sign. And that is very, very important because that is, you need 
the qualities, the energy of your sun sign in order to feel fully alive, in order to feel fully like your sun is shining out into your solar system, okay? So it's, it's that central, it's a pivotal sense of yourself around which the other needs and drives. So it's the need we have to be a unique someone. It's the need we have to be the center of our own sense of self in a positive sense, okay? And the sun is considered, quote, masculine in Western astrology. So it's very much complemented by the moon, which is considered feminine, okay? And the, the, where the moon is in your chart in terms of what sign is one of the very most basic components of your personality. And for women especially, since we're embodied in female bodies, the moon is very important, but it is for everyone, okay? So in terms of the person who was scheduled to give this talk was, going, was supposed to be giving a talk on the inner marriage between the sun and the moon. <laughs> so I'm not that person. I have no idea what he was going to say about it. But, um, you know, I thought I would, could introduce that theme because astrological symbolism is very clear about the interplay it's the circle of wholeness and therefore of oneness, right? But all of the signs, all of the houses and are all based on a unity of opposites, okay? And there are opposites in terms of whether something is considered feminine or masculine. And then you look for the interplay or the balance between those two. Does that make sense? So one of the most basic is between the sun and the moon. So the sun is considered the masculine sense of identity and the moon is the feminine complement. And the moon is feminine uh, in terms of our emotions and it's symbolic of the emotional realm. It's symbolic of the need we all have to feel safe, to have a sense of belonging, to have a sense of being nurtured and nurturing. Uh, it's that feminine realm. And um, anyone that works in a hospital, I have a friend that works in an emergency room in a hospital, and she always knows that if it's full moon, they'll be busier. You know, that's a stereotypical thing, but it is true. Police departments and hospitals consistently confirm <laughs> that when the moon is full, emotions run higher, accidents happen more commonly. Um, so the moon is symbolic of that emotional realm, and as it moves, as it waxes and wanes, it governs the daily rhythm of life. So it's a daily influence around um, how things are peaking. Does that make sense? Go ahead. So the moon is at the 180 degrees opposite of the sun, so if you're a sign, say Taurus, would your moon be, so if the Taurus was two, would your, would your moon be the sign that was the That's a good question, and no, that's not, that's not the case. It's symbolically, the sun and the moon represent a masculine and feminine principle. But in actuality, and this is what part of what makes up our uniqueness, so you have your 12 signs by your sun, right? But then everyone's moon could be in any of those 12 signs as well. So just by looking at sun and moon, you have 144 types of people. Do you see what I mean? <laughs> because you have the airy sun with a whole range of different possibilities for the moon. 12 squared. <laughs> yes, that's right, 12 squared, so 144 types. And if you go to a party where people are hip and they're into astrology, they'll want to know not only your sun sign, your moon sign, but your rising sign. And that's also, the rising sign is what's also called the ascendant. But it, they're just two terms for the same thing. And this is the sign in the horizon where the sun is rising at the time you were born. So of everything in the chart, what is most determined by the exact time of birth is the rising sign, okay? 
So if you go to a party, they'll want to know your sun sign, your moon sign, your rising sign. So what's 144 times 12? I'll do this real quick. So we're already up to 1,728 types of people by the time you combine those three things. And of course, then you, you still have Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter. So you see how specific an individual chart becomes once you, you start to fine tune it in this way. But the time you were born determines the exact rising sign. The rising sign determines where the first house is, and then everything falls around that. So I'm getting to the houses in a minute. <laughs> yeah, the, the signs go like this. So this is the first house, second house, third house. Um, so I'm still on the planets. The planets are symbolic of needs and drives. We've covered the sun and the moon. Mercury um, is the next planet, and it's associated with your mind. So it's symbolic of how we learn, how we process ideas and information, how oriented we are. It represents our need to communicate and to understand the world around us and to communicate with us. Okay? That's, and if you know your mythology, it's very useful to start correlating mythology and um, astrology. And so Mercury mythologically was the messenger of the gods. Okay? So again, there's this idea of awareness, understanding. Um, so I'm going to continue through the planets and what they represent, but I'm going to, uh, this is a lot of information. I'm basically giving you a crash course in the, in the basics of astrology here. The houses are these slices of the circle. And a house is symbolic of different areas of life's activities. Okay? That's the basic idea. And like I said, we all have all the houses, but... And they're equal in size. In different systems, it varies. You, there's one system that makes them all equal in size and one that makes them not equal. Okay? So that's one of the, the nuances. But the first house is called the house of self. It's how you express to the world. So people usually really identify with their rising sign. Okay? Like I have sun in Taurus, but my rising sign is Libra. And how, what your rising sign is, a lot of times is even more what people might guess about who you are. Because it's how you project to people. It's the social mask you wear, but it's not just a mask. It's also a sense of who you are. And so the first house is all about self-expression. And the opposite house is the seventh house. That's the house of one-on-one -on -one relationships. It's the house of marriage, of close friendship, of working with the public. It's about the other. So this opposite is self and other. And isn't that something in life we're always balancing? And this is going to be shown in other ways with other oppositions. But here, so here's the thing, how all these different symbols start to come together. Every sign is associated with a particular planet and is associated with a particular house. So they all become variations on a theme. So the first house is the house of self. It's associated with the sign Aries, the first sign of the zodiac. And Aries as a sign is associated with the planet Mars. Do you see how that goes? Second house is called the house of money, values, and resources. I could flush that out, and maybe I will. It's the second sign. It's associated with the second sign, which is Taurus. And Taurus is associated with two sides. Uh, it is associated with the planet Venus. And so on around the chart. Third house is Gemini, which is the third sign. Gemini is associated with Mercury. That's the symbol for Mercury, the mind. So if you know about Gemini, Geminis are supposed to be curious, right? They're, supposed to, they're symbolized by the twins. They're interested in learning about the other. They're curious. They like to know a little bit about a lot of things. They're, it's a mutable sign, so they tend to be very quick. They like to talk, and they're quick 
and they don't necessarily go really deep into a subject because they like to know a little here, a little here, a little here. They'll only go deep if they have another energy, like if they have Scorpio, Scorpio likes to go deep. So then it, you know, it might give them both. But do you see, I'm trying to give you the basic idea of how it's all an interplay. It's symbols within symbols within symbols, but they're variations on a theme. Does that make sense, that basic idea? Okay. Um, so just to go back to the planets then, Venus is the next planet, it's, symbol it's the next feminine planet, okay? And in terms of mythology, Venus would be Aphrodite. Um, I, I was, the same time period for me was when Jean Shinoda's, Jean Shinoda Boland's book, The Goddesses and Every Woman, came out. I don't know if, it, has anyone read that book? It was, it was a big book when it came out and then it kind of, you know, got lost in the shuffle, but um, anyway. It's a book that, again, looks at these old mythologies not as something irrelevant, because Jean Shinoda Bolin is a Jungian analyst. So she looked at these old myths about the gods and the goddesses in the Greek mythology and then talked about what does that symbolize for us as a modern person. And so she talked a lot about Aphrodite. And um, Aphrodite, astrologically, would be represented by Venus. It's woman not as mother nurturer, but it's woman as lover creator, okay? So it's the sexier, um, juicier, creative, artistic side of the feminine, okay? And so Venus represents the need we all have to feel loved, to feel valued, to have beauty and pleasure in our lives and to be in relationship. Um, it's known for its sensual appreciation of the physical world. Okay, those are some of the needs that Venus symbolizes. Um, and the next planet then is Mars. Mars is masculine. And it is, in mythology, Mars was the god of war. And um, Mars, even how it looks in the solar system, is called the red planet. So it's, a, it's an energy that's about how we go out after what we want, okay? I loved the expression early on, Venus attracts to her what she wants, Mars goes out and gets it, you know? It's two different orientations, and we all need to have both <laughs> to some extent. But, you know, that idea what you get with, that Venus is attracting to her what you want, what she wants made sense to me of why women throughout time have been into like makeup and fancy clothes and jewelry and all that kind of thing. It's like part of that attractive principle, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so those planets, those five planets are called the personal planets. And that's what makes up your most intimate sense of yourself and your most intimate needs. The next two planets are called social planets and that's Jupiter and Saturn. And Jupiter is what? The largest planet in the solar system, and symbolically that's how it works. Jupiter is an expansive influence, and it's a drive to get the big picture. So Jupiter represents the need we have in a certain sense for a greater understanding, whereas Gemini is in there getting the details, Jupiter wants to get a higher perspective and see not just the trees, but the forest, okay? So it's a drive for a, a higher understanding. And it tends to, uh, if, if a chart has a very strong Jupiter, the person tends to be expansive. They can either sometimes be literally big or have a tendency to overindulge or just overdo, take on more things than they can handle. There's a variety of ways it can come out, but you'll see that exuberant, expansive energy if you see a pronounced Jupiter. But for all of us, it represents the need we have to feel, at least at times, that sense of optimism, buoyancy, faith, expansion, and higher understanding. Saturn, I've already mentioned, is the re Saturn return. Saturn is the planet that represents the need we have to learn lessons in a certain sense. It's called the great lord of karma, the great teacher. 
So you don't have to read too much astrology before you really pay attention when you hear about Saturn transits and um, where Saturn is placed in the chart. I mentioned in my little description that um, you know I wanted to look at like the idea of the intermarriage of the male and female, but also in terms of the soul's journey or in terms of a psychological understanding, confronting the shadow is a big part of the journey. Or in Jungian terms, um, he would talk about the, the weaker element. And he believed that we were saved not through emphasizing our strengths, but through incorporating and embracing our weaknesses. That paradoxically, it's embracing what we've been trying to push away that leads us to wholeness. And wholeness was what Jungian psychology is really geared towards. It's not geared towards trying to be a saint and to be perfect, but to rest in this prior wholeness that allows for everything. Does that make sense? So Saturn, if you were going to look, there's other indicators as well, but Saturn is a key indicator for people of the shadow in a certain sense. Wherever Saturn is in the chart, and everyone has it someplace, is a place of fear, a place of wounding, a place of insecurity, a place where the person has had to struggle in some way. And Saturn transits are times when we feel challenged, where sometimes it can be that we feel overwhelmed with work or duty or responsibilities. Those are all very Saturnian types of things. Um, it can be times when we're challenged and feel more depressed or tired. Those can be uh, some of the qualities associated with Saturn. But whereas Jupiter is about expansion, Saturn is about contraction. And they're both necessary, and they're both have strengths and weaknesses. So it's not like one is good and one is bad. Um, but one tends to be more fun <laughs> in some ways than the other one. Well, from mythology, uh, Jupiter is the equivalent of Jove or Zeus, or the king yes. of the pantheon of gods and goddesses in right. ancient Greece. Right. And, and Saturn, Saturn was Kronos. The measure of time. The measure of time, but Kronos also was known for um, eating all of its progeny and later regurgitating it. Yes, that's an interesting layer of type of um, symbolism to go into. What I would say here, are you all still following me? I mean, when I look around, it seems like you are, but if anyone's really getting... <laughs> And we're, we're about to a point where we'll take a break and then uh, we can regroup um, and maybe finish going around the circle. But the thing I wanted to say about Saturn is wherever it is in the chart is a place of a particular challenge. And we're not going to, I'll probably not have time to pull this all together, but see if you continue around understanding what the different houses represent and what where the planets are associated, wherever Saturn falls, like let's say you have Saturn in the third house. The third house is Gemini's house, it's Mercury's house, so it's a house that has to do with learning, has, has to do with how you experience schools and education and the need to communicate. If you put Saturn in that house, usually the person has struggled with a sense of inferiority or inadequacy in that area. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that they won't excel. They might, in fact, particularly excel in the area, or they might not. But underneath, there'll be the same issue of a wounding or a, a, or a having to meet a challenge in that area. Do you see what I'm saying? If you put that same planet, say, in the seventh house of marriage and close one-on-one -on -one relationships, that same wounding that same challenge will show up over and over again in their intimate relationships. Saturn is also representative somewhat as, as um, you were pointing out of the father and not only of the individual father although it is that but also the fathers in terms of patriarchy or in terms of society social expectations what you have to do to measure up and fit in and be accepted that also is part of Saturn's rule. 
So sometimes you'll see women with Saturn in the seventh house that will be drawn to older men. You know, that's one way it could come out. But do you see how then it all becomes playing with symbolism? You look at the symbolism of what a house represents, you look at the symbolism of what a planet represents, and then you start to see how they fit together. And we're going to finish all that around, but this kind of goes back to your question about would the sun be opposite to the moon? Let's say the sun is here and the moon is here. That will be, now we get into the geometry of the circle. The circle has 360 degrees. If you put planets 90 degrees apart, that divides the circle into a square, doesn't it? So if the planets are 90 degrees apart from each other, that's called a square aspect. A square, you can feel it if you play with it with your fingers, is a stressful relationship. Okay, it's a conflictual, they're at odds with each other. They're in very different energies and so they don't combine easily. If you put it 120 degrees apart, that divides the circle into a triangle. So that's called a trine. Trines are considered harmonious, easy flows of energy. So if you get someone and their sun and their, their moon are in an easy aspect to each other, they have an easier time to bring those parts of themselves into a harmonious relationship. But again, harm, it doesn't mean that one is good and one is bad. Because when it's challenging is sometimes when the person really accomplishes more, paradoxically. Does that make sense? So even though we haven't made it all the way around the circle, and we'll have to save that for after the break, or maybe we'll head a different direction based on where people's interests are. But those basic, those are the basic symbolic parts of the astrological language. So you can see where the individual chart gets to be quite specific. By the time you have the symbolism of the planets, in the signs, in the houses, and then in different aspects to each other. And the aspects are what really make the chart come alive. When I do a reading, I rely a lot on the aspects because that's where you get all the players on the stage, right? That's where you see what is the dramatic tension? What is the storyline? What are the issues? That's where the juice of the person's life journey as reflected in the chart really comes from being kind of a flat little bits of information to kind of standing up and you know taking on that depth of a real story of a drama uh, that unfolds and you start to have this sense of what are the key players and are those players happy with each other or not like we already know Saturn is a, conf uh, a challenging influence or a strengthening through challenge so if you put Saturn exactly conjunct the sun, let's say. Let's say in your chart you have the sun and it's right next to Saturn. How, how do you think that would feel? What's, how does that symbolism combine for you? Someone, the one way I describe it is I say, you know, the sun just wants to shine, right? And the sun is um, associated with the sign Leo. So if you think about what you know about the energy of Leo, it's fixed fire. It wants to shine, it wants to be noticed, it wants to be the center of attention. It can be very generous when those basic needs to be noticed are met, okay? But it, that's what it wants to do. Saturn comes along and what I say is, it's like a big mountain comes along and sits right next to the sun and says, here, try to shine through this. <laughs> You know, Saturn is a very restraining influence. And so right away, uh, you start to get a flavor that if, um, for how that particular sun is going to be able to shine or not shine easily. Do you see what I'm saying? So in a way, astrology is extremely easy. It's basically four kind of basic symbols. 
But then it gets totally elaborated because those symbols are like magnified around and combined in a, not a truly infinite, but a nearly seemingly infinite variety of ways, which is where the uniqueness um, is really allowed for. And I guess that will, in terms of trying to wrap up before the break, and then, you know, we can kind of be open-ended when we come back, you can tell me, um, you know, whether I'm happy to kind of continue with this, or I'm happy to kind of shift gears and talk about, um, you know, some of the other ways that astrology has shown up. But in terms of if I go back to when I was first approaching astrology, and what I've noticed over the years of doing readings with people, is I think there's two ways you can approach astrology, like, you know, two basic ways you can approach so much in life. But one way I noticed is I could go to astrology out of a basic underlying sense of fear and anxiety and a sense of like, oh my God, I want to be prepared. I want to try to arm myself with as much knowledge and information as possible so that I can increase my sense of maybe being in control. <laughs> and um, that's one way to approach astrology. But another way that it really worked for me and what has kept my enjoyment of astrology alive is to come to it with that sense of awe and wonder. To come to it with that sense of having your life, which we can tend to, you know, just be plodding along with blinders, to have it be an opportunity to step back and let the blinders open and realize that there are cycles of energy within cycles of energy and that we belong. We're part of it. We're an innate expression. You know, we belong in the universe. We're part of the basic patterning. And that there's a symbolic understanding that is, as Jung said, calling us to our futures. And that there's an innate potential that our soul has come in to realize. And that we can use the mandala of the chart and use the signpost of the transits of what's happening in our life as a way to see that bigger picture and to allow that potential to have more sense and more opportunity to unfold. And that, I find, is a very um, empowering and joyful use of the symbolic language of astrology. So we'll take a break now. Uh, well, it's not quite in the same sign, but where, where Chiron is, is in between Saturn and Uranus in terms of where it orbits. And so it's considered a bridge from, from the known world of Saturn to the transpersonal planets of the outer planets. It's a bridge in between the two. And most people associate Chiron now with the sign Virgo. And it's associated with the energy of the wounded healer and represented by the centaur. And the centaur, of course, is half animal, half human. And so it represents that urge or that transitional part of relating um, uh, between the body and the mind. And the time that Chiron was sighted in the heavens was in the early 70s, which is right when the holistic health <coughs> movement was starting to gain momentum. So that's the synchronicity there, like we were talking about with the other planets. Um, so, it's, so it's interesting, um, and I do find that Chiron um, can be quite um, um, important in certain charts. Um, All right, so I know at least one thing I want to cover from something that was raised at the break, but why don't I take a chance, since it's a small number of people now, why don't we just go around and each of you can say, like, where you're at with like what you're interested in, what's made sense, not made sense, or what you want me to kind of focus in more, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. I'm first? Sure. <laughs> I am looking at you, Alison. <laughs> <laughs> <It's like, wow. laughs> you. Should I look over here? I'm I sorry. No, um, astrology has always been kind of one of those things that I never knew, knew anything about. Uh huh. And I'd read, read the paper and read my sign, what it has to say, and that kind of thing. Lately, I've been reading some ruins. 
Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Do some soul searching. Was it all me? Mm hmm. So it was, it was a good first hour. Just learned a lot. Good. I've never seen a chart before, so that was very interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just... Might have you do mine. <laughs> <laughs> good. I talked him into coming. <laughs> <laughs> A good but feminine I you role. Were be somebody else. <laughs> but I'm really glad you are here because I think his talk might have been the over my head. I'm not sure. You know, this is, I'm really. Yeah. Well, when I asked for the show of hands and realized that <laughs> no one knew the basics, I thought, okay, good, I'll just start. <laughs> yes, you are the expert here. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. This is um, this is really good, um, and I. Probably call you too and, and talk to you about reading my, my chart. I think we're all on this path and trying to figure it all out, and uh, I am certainly no exception. Um, a lot of a lot of changes going on at this point. But you know, one thing I did want to ask you um, under rising signs um, mm -hmm. it, that was directly related to time of birth. Yes. So how important is it like if the doctor slapped your behind and didn't look at the clock <laughs> right in time, you know, maybe he was a little behind, he got five minutes off, is that a big deal? Or? For for most practical purposes, no. Okay. Is it on the um, cusp usually then? Yeah, I was going to say, there's a few. The rising sign changes every two hours because there's 12 signs and 24 hours in the day, mm -hmm. so every two hours it's shifting. If you happen to be on what's called the cusp, right, between two signs, then it might determine. But usually, each sign that follows the next are so different from one another that usually then you can get a sense of which one would be the accurate one. And if it only shifted within the same sign but by a degree or two, it would make some difference, but, um, but not, not a lot. Is people, some people don't know their birth time at all, and then that, um, that affects more. <laughs> and do you shift it to like Greenwich Mean Time? Do you standardize that time? Of the birth? computer does all that, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you know, you go with whether it's Eastern or, you know, you go with the, the um, yeah, you go with all of that, and they make it very specific. So there is a lot of math. I mean, in the early, now it's all done by computers, of course, and I, to tell you the truth, I wouldn't even know how to calculate a chart without a computer at this point. But not that long ago, it was all done by hand, and it involved a lot of math and um, a lot of geometry. Mm -hmm. But now it's just a quick printout. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. How long does it take you to prepare a chart then? Well, you know, it depends how much is going on in the chart, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally about a half hour okay. I'll put in like looking at the natal chart and preparing some notes on the transits, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. That, that wasn't the right answer. It's an hour, an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it used to be, you know, I used to spend two hours getting ready for an hour reading, but you know, <laughs> you do get faster over the years. <laughs> And since the computer does the calculations, I still tend to draw in the aspects by hand because that's part of how I tune into the chart. Mm -hmm. And it just gives me a way of settling and kind of letting my unconscious start to connect with things. And then I make my notes. But then really it's the intuition of connecting with the person. And I try to give a pretty complete reading, you know. Um, but there almost always comes a certain magical point in the chart where it's like, okay, this is what the person came to hear. Mm -hmm. And if they only hear this, this That's is what they're really here for, and the rest of it's just detailing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's something that comes through making that connection with a particular person and, and trusting my heart and my intuition. And, and that becomes, you know, it's a, it's a shared discovery mm -hmm. what that is usually. Okay. And if you go see her, she does a very good job. I, mean, <laughs> I guess Don's the only one here who has actually had a reading <laughs> with me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I used to do Thank well, you. The numerology the same way. My first computer program was in numerology to do just what she's saying, use a computer to get the math out of the way. Then you start on the right brain. Now I'm an ex-engineer, so I didn't want to acknowledge using the right brain. <laughs> but she's she's a number one, you know. Once you get those figures down, once you get the that chart set up, 
when she starts in on integrating it. And that's where the magic comes in. And it's also, you. I'm sure there are many astrologers that could give you more, you know, who might give you fancier, or more, things. yeah, things. But I feel like I have a particular skill having been a counselor and a spiritual teacher to actually making that heart connection with a person and then and then communicating in such a way that it's of use. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes you can get a lot of fancy or sophisticated insights that shows off the astrologer's knowledge, but it doesn't really help the person. <laughs> <laughs> You say you kind of go away of saying, "Wow, I guess he really knows a lot." But you know, you're going, "I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this." <laughs> so you know, my my thing is sometimes I stay more basic, but I really listen to connect with the person and and remember, there's a synchronicity to why this particular person is coming to see me at this particular time, and I try to stay open to what that need is, and then respond to that. So. <laughs> well, did you? Okay, so our, how about you? Anything? I know one thing you want me to focus on, uh, which I'll share on, but anything else? Um, yeah, if I get one thing, that'd probably be good. <laughs> I okay. mean, if you know already, then I shouldn't say anything. But I have had a lot of readings in, in, over years and years, you know, just mm -hmm. every. And tonight's actually been fascinating because I don't think I've ever had a lesson. Mm -hmm. So I have these tapes, and then you listen to the tapes, and you know, and they're telling you all this stuff. But I think it'll be really more. Um, I might even be able to go back to natal chart, or you know, yeah. to, to really hear some things differently. And I'm interested in kind of some of the filling in the pieces, filling although in you the pieces, can't do yeah. everything in one night. But it's been. I used to teach good. classes where you'd have one night on the houses, and one night on the yeah. planets, and one night on the signs, <laughs> and one night on the aspects, everything. and one night to put it together. <laughs> Right. But this gives you at least a flavor, and we can fill flavor. in more. Okay. And maybe I could ask you just one practical sure, question. Sure, go ahead. So after Scorpio is? Sagittarius. Sagittarius. That's the one. So yeah. it's Sagittarius, then Capricorn? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. That's the one I was asking. And I always picture it, Scorpio is the sign that loves to go deep. Uh -huh. So I always picture Scorpio diving deep. And then it's like after you reach the depths, then Sagittarius wants to soar high. <laughs> so then you get the Sagittarian impulse to soar high. And it's like that around the chart. Each six, next sign is very different from the previous sign because it's introducing something new in the puzzle, you know, a new impetus or a new... Um, so when, they, when so. you did this, I wrote them. Mm -hmm. And it, does it do that? It, it switches just like that. So. It's water, fixed Scorpio, then fire, mutable Sagittarius. Did I do it right? Yes. Okay. Thank yes. You. That's and that's how you get the interplay of four. I find, and that is a simple thing, but not everyone gets that, that the 12 signs are coming from a play of the four elements and the Just three qualities. And that, that is a very important part of the symbolic understanding mm -hmm. of yeah. how it fits together and how one thing leads to another. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. How about you? I'm interested in all the esoteric arts. I, I've studied how to do tarot, numerology, the Enneagram. And I know a little bit about astrology, and I've always been interested in it. And there's this person in England called Jonathan Cainer. Okay. I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. No, I a, don't know He's him. a pretty well-known astrologer in England. But I like his writings and his, his forecasts and everything. He's a very sort of philosoph philosophical thing, and I can relate to him. And I guess because he's the same sign as me, Sagittarius. And he, sort of resonates with me a lot, but there's a couple of things I was going to ask you. When you drew this, the planets in the houses, was it, is that the ruling planet? It's, um, the ruling planet is um, a little different. Whatever planet is associated with the rising sign is called the chart ruler. Okay. And it's part of what makes the rising sign so important. So when you go to do a chart reading, you know how I said you can know lots of bits and pieces about astrology, but you still, like, when you look at a chart, it's like, okay, how do I synthesize this information together in a useful way? So there's different, this is part of the art. The astrology has a, the science in terms of the math of it, but the art is the symbolism and then getting a feel for each chart and which planets are prominent. 
So there's a couple, there's different ways we gauge how important a particular planet is in this particular chart. And one automatic thing is the chart ruler. So if you have Libra rising, mm -hmm. the planet associated with Libra is Venus. So right away, that's called the chart ruler, and you know Venus is really important in this chart. Whereas if you have Sagittarius writing, Sagittarius is associated with Jupiter, so then you know Jupiter is particularly important. So that's one way that you start to differentiate between charts. Another way is the main <laughs> axis, this axis, and this axis of the cross. The cross, of course, is the ancient symbol used long before Christianity, the ancient symbol about earthly life, about incarnation into a body and incarnation into the physical world. The number four and the cross is what is the ancient symbol about that. So the cross is an old, old symbol for spirit being crucified into the four corners of the physical world and then needing to find resurrection or new life in the midst of that. And this main cross within the chart, I always call it like a main artery. Whatever is close to the main axis is like near a main artery. So that takes on a particular importance. So you mentioned you have Pluto right on your ascendant. That's why everyone says, oh my goodness. Because here, it's like really prominent in your chart then, okay? So no matter what, I don't know what your sign is, but let's say you're a Gemini. Just from having Pluto here, you have a certain Scorpio flavor because Pluto is associated with Scorpio. So that's where you start to get the interplay. So, in, and same thing, if you have a planet up here, let's say you have Mercury up here, then you know, okay, Mercury is a very important planet in this particular chart because it's so, it's placed in sens a sensitive place. The other thing you start to get a feel for, there are, you know, when I said there are aspects, well, one, then you look for patterns of aspects and those are given different names. So one pattern is what's called a T-square. So if you have planets that are opposing each other and then all of them are squaring a third planet, that's called a T-square and it puts a tremendous amount of focus on whatever planet is at the head of the T. Mm -hmm. And so that's, not all charts have that, but if it does, if you see a chart where there's a T-square, Whatever planet the T-square is pointing to, you know that planet takes on a heightened role in that particular chart. So that becomes part of the art of astrology, is to hone in on the particular flavors and particular dynamics chart by chart. And there's a lot of different ways that you factor in to get that sense. But those are some of the main ones. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. And now back to yours. Did it did it help with yours, or did oh, you have? Yeah, because I could always like when you get a sun sign reading, for example, they always talk about your ruling planet. If mm -hmm. Something's going on with that, and that's why I always wondered. Yes. Well, again, because I said it's an interplay of symbols, so that every sign correlates to a planet, mm -hmm. correlates to a house. Then. Um, Let's say someone doesn't actually have any Gemini energy, but they have five planets down here in the third house. That will give them a certain Gemini flavor because of the third house emphasis. Do you see that? Um, and so you will hear people talk about a sun ruler, but the main ruler is, is the, the chart ruler, which is associated with the rising sign. The other thing I was going to ask, because you said you did Christian mysticism, you studied that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was thinking, because I went to a talk on the Enneagram, I don't know if you know that guy down in Mount Shasta, Carl? Uh, yes, I yeah. do know Carl, actually. Oh, yeah, because uh -huh. yeah, he was doing some workshops up here, and mm -hmm. I took one of those workshops. Mm -hmm. uh, he was saying that it actually came from the secret archives of the Vatican, the Enneagram. Hmm. I, do, I'm, I know Carl. And I know there's lots of speculation about where the Enneagram has uh, come from. And I hadn't heard that about the Vatican, so I don't know how to comment on that. What is the Enneagram? 
it's an, it's like it's kind of like a circle as well, but there's nine points on the circle and different aspects of your personality, and uh, it's almost it's fun, it's kind of similar in a way because you get these like the points lining up in similar fashions, like going forward and backward, almost like in astrology. Is and it everything. based on your birth date? Um, no, no, it's it's quite it's it's a very insightful um, way of understanding on a surface level personality types mm -hmm. okay so on a fir personality level and there's nine different types in the Enneagram and there are three that are called fear based and three that are anger based and three that are sorrow based and um, and they're a basic description of certain fixated patterns that people tend to enact over and over and over again so you pick which one sounds right for you um, there are books and websites where they give you questions to help help you hone in, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is basically self insight mm -hmm. about recognizing what your core pattern is. Mm -hmm. And personally, I have found that a lot of people, at least initially, misidentify themselves. <laughs> 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 like sometimes you're going, "Oh, why? How could that?" Be? <laughs> but uh, um, but at a deeper level. It's really about understanding um, what keeps you from freedom. You know, that's the thing. I mean, my, my basic identity is as a spiritual teacher. So what I'm interested in basically is helping people to um, return to that innate sense of spiritual freedom and the innate happiness, not the outer happiness. Although that's okay Let too. The but child come out. <laughs> yes. So. The Enneagram is the most useful system I've found for understanding what are the fixated patterns that are so natural to you that it, you literally think it's who you are, but instead it's what is keeping you from who you truly are oh, as wow. a free spiritual being. And so at a deeper level, the Enneagram becomes, it's kind of like knowing the key to your particular jail. It's like if you really understand your type and you really understand what's underneath it, then you have the more direct understanding, not for who you are, but for what is keeping you stuck in a more surface level sense of yourself and therefore can help you break free of that. But they're called fixations with good reason because they're... <laughs> <laughs> they seem they're so fixed. they're fixed. <laughs> they do not they do not give way easily. <laughs> mm. Now is that something that you guide people in or or how do you spell it? I mean maybe it's, it's called like it's E N N E A G R A M Enneagram. Ennea is the root meaning of nine or is a Greek word or something that points to nine. So Enneagram is a nine pointed system. I'm sure the metaphysical, this stack of books here are just some of the astrology books that the metaphysical library has, some of my favorites. Um, and th they'll also have some books on the Enneagram and you can also Google it. Okay. The two authors that people usually start with for the Enneagram are either Helen Palmer or Don Riso. And they're both good, Helen Palmer and Don Riso. Um, they're both very good um, for the basic understanding and that's where you want to start. If eventually you want to go deeper, um, there's a book called The Spiritual Dimensions of the Enneagram by Sandra Mayatri mm -hmm. and that will take you a whole new depth with it. Like a Scorpio type. Exactly. <laughs> okay. And that's how I know Carl because we're both students of Sandra Mayatri together. Okay. You know, do you know Mahler as well? No. Mahler is too. Mm -mm. Okay. I don't. I know he's teaching with someone, but I yeah, don't know. Yeah, they're the kind of points now down there. Yeah. I, I missed my one. My, I'm number four. Okay. And that was the first one I did because everyone wants to come to that because they hope that that for some the romantic for some reason everyone wants to believe they're that number even if they're not. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they say. No one wants to pretend they're my type. <laughs> <laughs> you are. <laughs> she, she's I don't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs>
But anyway, I highly recommend the Enneagram. It's good fun. Okay. And, and if you go to hip parties around here now, they'll want to know your Enneagram type. So <laughs> see how busy you've got to be. <laughs> um, all right, I'll mention some of these. And how about you? Is there anything that you particularly were struck by or want me to cover? Or? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'm here to find out how this um, that you're explaining is a tool to the inner journey to the expansion of individual and collective consciousness. Okay. Phew. What? <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> That's good. I'm still choking. <laughs> individual can be done, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I, I think I'll, I'll take the disclaimer. As I said in the beginning, my forte is really the individual chart and the individual journey and the relationship dynamics, like where you take two individual charts and see how they interact. Um, all of that, I feel like I have good ground to stand on. When it comes to the, some of the social, I have read on it, and I'm interested in it, and um, intrigued by it. But, you know, to be honest, in terms of a basis of prediction or understanding different stages in history, even though there's some fascinating astrological correlations, like the, one we, the ones we were talking about at the break, in terms of accuracy of periods and evolution, I find the Mayan calendar much more effective. So on the collective level, I tend to rely on that more. Well then, uh, I would say, how do you use these tools or principles to awaken the higher consciousness in an individual person, starting with yourself or anyone else that comes? Well, I think awareness, awareness is always the key in my experience, okay? That basic adage, seek ye the truth and the truth will set you free. And the truth is always an unfolding horizon. <laughs> what, but then any, any of these disciplines, astrology, Enneagram, numerology, whatever, can help lead you down the path of that same... Yeah, that's reality. what I mean. They can bring awareness. Right. And awareness itself... Phenology. ...is what... Um, is what gives you that edge of freedom, you know. It's like, if you can get even just a centimeter space perspective or um, distance on something, not in terms of suppressing it or Stepping pushing it away, it. but just having that awareness of it rather than being totally caught in it. Mm -hmm. It's just that little shift that makes all the difference between then mm -hmm. misidentifying and losing yourself in it or maintaining awareness and working with it and allowing it then to become fuel for the transformation itself. So awareness is always really the key thing. And a mental level awareness, which is the main thing astrology gives, isn't, doesn't solve the equation. You know, it's like when someone comes to me, I can give them the time frame of the transits and the meaning of the transits, but that doesn't save them from walking through it breath by breath, step by step, and then how they actually engage that is what, you know, is what really determines how transformative it becomes. Um, and that's where the spiritual practices of breathing and being present with and really feeling it, not, not distancing, but really letting yourself be present with it is what is actually transformative. And of course, astrology can't give you that. From intellect to intuition. But by giving you the mental awareness, yeah. the mental awareness mm -hmm. helps you trust and understand and, and, and go with hopefully, than the, the actual part that allows it to become you know, embodied in your being. There's a great book I've been reading recently called Handbook to Higher Consciousness mm -hmm. by King Keyes. Mm -hmm. It was originally published in the 70s, and it yeah, it's been around exactly a long time. about conscious awareness and stepping back from the dramas that 
I guess than virtually most people. Well, well everyone, even you can't become like, because uh, you know the Buddhists are always saying that the ultimate goal of life is to become a Buddha, enlightened. But we just cannot because we're in the physical world. We can't escape from the the dramas and everything. But we can step back and not be so affected as it as we. I know what you're saying. Yeah. Let me give you my rendition of that, and then I'll go into a story part. Um, in terms of my understanding of spirituality, or to become self-realized, is to disidentify from the physical. the physical, emotional, mental aspects of ourself, which is what we're conditioned into believing is the sum total of reality and feeling this unchanging presence that doesn't change, that is just that unchanging presence. And that is what gives this kind of innate sense of peace of what the Buddhists call the Buddha nature. It's almost like okay. nothingness, do you think? Or and silence the, or nothingness. Or, exactly. Yeah. It, and it's a confrontation in a sense with what initially feels like a void. But here's the thing, and so the key way that that happens is to disidentify from your story, to disidentify from your thoughts, to disidentify from your emotions, to disidentify with how your body is feeling. And so that's why if you go to say to someone like Gangaji, the thing they're always repeating over and over again is drop the story, stop the story. The thoughts in your head. Just stop it. And, and that's how you shift. But my interest, so I understand that and relate that and you know, but I find my interest is on the soul level. And the soul level is intermediary between the personality and this unchanging essence. And the soul level is the level of story. That's why indigenous people have always told stories. That's why modern people, that's why one reason we love movies, we love books, we love stories. The soul responds to a story. The archetypes are images that have stories to them. And so on the soul level, telling your story or having a larger context of a story is very healing. So it, both are useful in their own way. And what's helpful is if you can understand that there's a difference and not confuse levels. <laughs> a lot of confusion out there from confusing levels. But the soul level is the, lore, is the level of story. And astrology works then on that. You know, if, if you truly wanted to be only self-realized, you would never bother with anything like astrology because who cares? You know, you're just in that unchanging realm. But mentioning then story gives me the perfect <laughs> segue to, to come into what we were talking about. So these are all books that are available at the library here. There's lots of others as well. But I thought I'd mention these. Stephen Forrest is an astrologer that it's not necessary for anyone to read um, on, on astrology. I mean, you, you know, it may not be your thing. Not everyone's going to get into it. But if you want a good basic introductory book on astrology, I find that this is one of the ba basic best ones. So it's The Inner Sky, and this is where he talks about all the planets, the signs, the houses. Then he has The Changing Sky, that's the transits, and then he has Sky Mates, that's the relationship dynamics. <laughs> so he writes very simply, very clearly, but not simplistically. So I, I recommend Stephen Forrest for basic introductory material. And then <coughs> three of my probably favorite astrologers out of all the astrologers there are, are these three. And one is Liz Green, and she's a Jungian psychologist. And so obviously she shares some of my uh, psychological bent. She's English. She wrote the classic book on Saturn, Saturn, A New Look at the Old Devil. Um, but she's written a number of other books as well, including this one, which I'm getting to for you. It's called The Astrology of Fate, and it's her book on the planet Pluto. 
And it's one where she correlates it to mythology. And so I'm going to share a story for you from that. Um, and another astrologer I've liked a lot is Stephen Arroyo. So this book, Astrology, Karma, and Transformation, is very insightful. And he also wrote another book, which I didn't pick up, where he really goes into the elements and, and how it's important to understand the elements and the qualities. So those are also books I can recommend. And then uh, Liz Green, along with this guy Howard Sesportis, who I also like, they started a whole institute in England of the joint study of astrology and psychology, and they've put out a whole series of books. And this is one they did on the sun and the moon, and they have another one. They have a whole series. So those are also, if any of you want to really knock yourselves out and start studying it, those are books that I can recommend. Um, there's a book of transits. The most common one people know is by Robert Hand, which the uh, library has several copies of. It's not a bad book. It's a basic cook, what's called a cookbook uh, of uh, transits. But again, I have Mars and Scorpio, so I don't like to stay on the surface. <laughs> I like to go deep. <laughs> and I find that book a little surfacey. So this book, The Gods of Change, is much more to my liking. It goes a lot deeper into what some of the uh, transits can be about. Okay, so that's just if you want, that's my basic teacher style, you know, give you, give you some resources if you want to read more. Um, so now I haven't read this book for a number of years and it was only our conversation that kind of brought this story to mind. But this is a story that I found very useful, and I'm going to have to do my poor memory version of it. But in terms of mythology, of how you can begin to relate to it, Pluto, strong Pluto placements, Pluto transits, or strong Scorpio energy, because again, Scorpio is the sign that's associated with the planet Pluto. Um, tend to bring up, amongst other things, issues about control. So Pluto, if you think of a thumbnail definition, they will call it the planet of transformation. And we all think, oh good, I want to be transformed. <laughs> but Pluto, as someone mentioned, as Stephen mentioned, was also Hades, the god of the underworld. And so that's how Plutonian transformation comes about is through these death rebirth experiences. Like Phoenix, so, which is also another that's right. image of Scorpio. That's right. Or even it's more one deeply, of, the Eleusidian Mysteries. Yes. So, so death rebirth experiences or being abducted into hell by Hades doesn't mean a literal physical death necessarily, usually. But <laughs> <laughs> but it means a symbolic death. It means ego, being maybe? abducted abducted into hell by Hades or Pluto is symbolic of beating something that you have no control over. Something, as she says, about fate. <coughs> a word that we in the West and modern recent times haven't related to a lot. But it's something that is a force greater than yourself that you can't control. But initially, the ego doesn't want to admit that it can't control it, and therefore it tends to bring forth control issues. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's the difference between true power and false power. Mm -hmm. False power is the ego's pretense of thinking that it's in charge and can control how things happen. And true power, spiritually, is that, in religious sense, is submitting to God's will, but it's, it, it's in another sense, it's about coming into oneness with the Tao, with the way things are, and the ego recognizing that it isn't in charge. That in fact, in the end, it doesn't even really exist. Um, and that when you come into acceptance of something, then, paradoxically, there's a true empowerment that comes about. And this Easter that Sunday that's coming up on us, the Christian story in one way can be understood that way, that the, the crowds that welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem were expecting and wanting 
an outer savior. Hosanna, Hosanna, I think Hosanna literally means save us, rescue us, you know, some version of that. And instead, he came in on a donkey, submitted to the rule, and was crucified, and yet gave new life. And it's symbolic, it's a very deep archetypal story about the power that comes through actually submitting. And so this brings us back to Pluto, I haven't forgotten. So one of the stories that she tells in here is the myth and maybe some of you are going to remember your mythology. I'm not sure who the hero was. Was it Jason? One of the Greek heroes, and their task was to slay the Hydra. Do you remember this myth? And the hero was a very valiant, courageous, heroic, strong, wonderful warrior, a true hero figure. And he goes and he confronts the Hydra. And as he cuts off one arm of the hydra, two more spring forth. And he cuts off another one, and two more springs forth. And he cuts off, and he's given it his best. He's fighting the good fight. He's giving it his valiant best effort. But as soon as he can cut off one arm of the hydra, two more spring back. And finally, in exhaustion, he sinks to his knees. And from his knees, he can see the soft underbelly of the hydra and he's able to raise his sword and slay the Hydra. Mm -hmm. So that's some Greek myth about some Greek hero. And she relates that mythological story as being very consistent with the inner dynamic of strong Pluto transits or uh, Scorpio issues is that it tends to bring forth that effort of, I'm going to do it, I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to make it happen. Sinking to the knees, of course, is symbolic of what? Surrender, submission. And paradoxically, in that gesture of giving up is when you see how the victory can be attained. So that is a myth that um, points to that whole dynamic, it communicates. And that's where stories are helpful because stories aren't just an equation, are they? You can't just say this means this. Stories, you kind of get a feel for the meaning of it, but then over time it lives on and you can get new levels of meaning and new insights. And so that's what I try to do sometimes when I give a reading, is I try to give a feel for the energy. I don't try to tin it down and say, this means this. But you try to get a feel for it so that the person has a whole then orientation of what to pay attention to. And, and then they get to live it out and discover it. And it gets to become embodied for them in their life. So I don't know if you relate to that. I think um, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, they, I just. I relate to it on many levels. I, yeah. I was in a school and they used to talk about um, real will. You know, yes. real will is, there's a difference between false will and real will. Yes. So it's similar. Exactly. And that you're participating. You know, it's, it's a passive will. It's mm -hmm. an intention and a, mm -hmm. but it's not a, you know. Right. Anyway, that's, I relate. That's right. To, yeah, I relate to it and by the meaning of mm -hmm. what you're saying. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and if, if you look at this book and run across it, I'm sure she, you know, brings out more about it, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. And uh, I thought of it right away when you shared. Yeah, so. thank you. Yes, yeah, you're very you welcome. Huh. Very welcome. So really the transients in the chart are, 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 are forever. But they're just different times in your life being whatever time it is that comes in your path is when you're going to travel those transients. Okay, good question. So, transits, what do we know about energy? Remember I said I looked at astrology as a symbolic language about energy and symbolic of the inner journey. Energy is always moving. So if you think of the planets, the moon goes around the chart every month. The sun goes around the chart every year. Mercury and Venus go around the chart basically every year. Mars, Mars takes not quite two years to go around the chart. The planet Jupiter takes 12 years to go around the chart. Okay? Saturn takes 28, 29 years to go around the chart. 
What is this? Uranus takes, Sorry. just let me finish this point. Uranus takes 84 years to go around the chart. Neptune takes 144, something like that. And Pluto takes about 240 years to go around. So those are what are called the transits. It's how long the planets take to transit. So the moon goes around every month. You hardly, I hardly pay attention to that. For farming, you know, there are things that you pay attention to where the moon is for sure. But in terms of when I give a reading, I don't pay any attention to that. So with transits, you tend to look at the outer planet transits because they don't happen very often. And when they do happen, they're in effect for a longer period of time. So the moon's influence comes and goes in a couple hours. The sun transits might last a day. But when you get to a Saturn transit, you're talking about a period of weeks. By the time you get to a Pluto transit, you're talking about a period of months and maybe even up to three years that that transit's in effect. So the outer planets, their transits, are what are really more powerful and significant. So if you come for a reading, you do the basic natal chart, which is what doesn't change over time. That's the basic personality imprint. That's how the energies were constellated at the moment when you theoretically took your first breath as an independent being. And how those cons energies are constellated, it's like that makes an imprint, that makes an impression, that is a pattern that is in play then. But the transits then, you're looking for where are the planets now. So let's say in your natal chart, you have Pluto here. In the course of your life, Pluto won't even go halfway around the chart. So, but let's say it has moved down here and is now conjuncting your sun, let's say. That then becomes very indicative of what kinds of energies are at work in your life right now. Do you get a sense mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. so, so, just like, so all transits are not equal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you hear people talking and, and you know they don't know a lot about astrology because they'll talk about, say, a Mercury transit to Uranus like it's a big thing. That's a very minor thing. But if the reverse, a Uranus transit to Mercury, that's a very significant thing. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? So some transits are very minor, hardly worth mentioning. But other transits are quite significant. And especially according to an individual chart. Again, if you know that this person has a T-square to their moon, and then you know that Pluto is coming along and squaring their moon, okay, then you know, set up, pay attention. This is going to be a really challenging you know, big time year for this person. So does that make sense in terms of the transits? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. And then there's another technique that are called progressions. And I, I won't even try to explain how that works, but, but with progressions, you pay more attention to the moon. Because whereas the moon by transit goes around every month, by progression, it takes the moon 30 years to go around. And so you look at the progressions of the moon for additional insight and information for what's likely to be coming up for a person. That's where I said astrology can... <laughs> so astrology and numerology have a lot of uh, similarities and patterns in how it looks at events? Um, Don is more the expert on numerology, but there's a there's lot... There's a lot of similarity. There's also a numer numer numerological astrological combination that some people get into as well. but. See, as far as I'm concerned, astrology is a bit more complete. Okay, it's it's numer. I've done a lot of numerology, writing the programs and doing that. But the astro astrological aspect gives you more well-rounded approach. Even in the tarot, if you get into the tarot, the tarot cards usually correlate with different signs and different planets, and so you know there's a lot of can be a symbolic crossover. Definitely, for me, astrology is where my experience is. I'm, you know. But you mentioned working with the runes. You know, all of these things, like Carl Jung was very big in working with the I Ching for years. Because they're all ways, in a way, to allow your unconscious mind to come into more play. And by having a, re a tarot reading, a rune reading, an I Ching reading, whatever it is, 
again, in the West, if you look at it in a strictly rational, linear way, it's like superstitious, irrational, and irrelevant. But once you open up the symbolic understanding, and once you realize the power of the unconscious, and once you realize, Jung said if he had his life to live <coughs> over, he would study, uh, focus on synchronicities. Mm -hmm. You've heard that term, synchronicities? Mm -hmm. He was fascinated with that at the end of his life. And part of why is because a true synchronicity is a reminder that there are forces at work greater than just our personalities. Mm -hmm. And so it's a reminder then of a greater context. And that's where these other readings, and even working with the chart, in a certain sense what it does is, is an invitation to your higher self, an invitation to the unconscious to come forward. And so it becomes, again, a way to reflect and gain insight. Bingo. Um, so. Do you think through that awareness, uh, the understanding of oneself is much greater? Yes. And then through, through experiences, you get where you get the wisdom from as mm -hmm. you get older. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully sooner too. <laughs> all, all, all of these, all of these methodologies are just tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like a slide rule used to be, where the computer's taking over, it's a tool. Yeah, and that's right. You know, astrology is a tool that, like any tool, can be used or misused. You know, I've had people come to me for readings, and they were coming like. Some astrologer had told them that they had to really be careful this week or they might be raped and the, you know, the person was terrified. And it was like, sure. you know. <laughs> so like any amount of information, it can be misused. Just like the Enneagram, you can use it to pigeonhole people or you can use it to understand and appreciate um, people. So any knowledge can be used or misused, but astrology um, can be quite useful. You know, in terms of like the health aspects, which isn't, again, my forte. I know certain things about transits and how they affect health, but it certainly isn't my um, specialty. But all of the signs also correlate with different parts of the body, starting with um, Aries rules the head, Taurus rules the throat, Gemini rules the lungs, Cancer rules the stomach, you know, on, on down to Pisces rules the feet. And, you know, when you first hear that, it's like, well, that's weird. But in esoteric understanding, the body is said to reflect the universe. So it's that basic law, as above, so below. You've maybe heard that Not principle. Chakras. So astrology correlates with that. So you, there's a lot of different ways you can be used. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's, it, it can be very fun. It can be very enlarging. Enlarging, that's not a word, but you know what I mean. <laughs> very expanding, you know because um, because of the of the symbolic story understanding that it calls forth so. another thing on the transits I was wondering what how do the planets moving in relation to it is the earth at the center of that job okay yeah we, we talked about that the um, astrology you know you, we do do it from the vantage point of life on earth <laughs> so it is um, yeah because the sun I was moving around and I thought right because we all know the solar system now. right right but, yeah. well hopefully we all know but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's where the story yeah. is interesting because I mean factually the other is mm -hmm. true and when you understand from our perspective. the holographic yeah. universe you even get a different perspective but nonetheless from life on this planet we experience it here, it looks so like we, it's we track it from here. Yeah. yeah, there was two terms that I wanted clarification on. Okay. One's retrograde and one's void of course. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what they mean um, in terms of energy. I can't exactly explain to you the, um, the um, science of it. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. But retrograde literally just means that from the vantage point of the Earth, it appears that the planet is moving backwards. Okay, yeah. That's called a retrograde motion. So I can't explain to you the astro oh, yeah, yeah. astronomy of that. Okay. But And astrologically, what that means, it is significant. So for instance, in the chart, say the planet Saturn is retrograde in the chart. You know how I said Saturn is symbolic in a certain sense of the wound or a shadow element? 
that's true for everyone. If Saturn is retrograde, it almost without exception, in fact I can say without exception over the years I've noticed that Saturn retrograde is someone who has internalized a very harsh inner critic. So that judging critical factor that is one of the aspects of Saturn, when it's retrograde the person turns that within and judges themselves very harshly. And so retrograde, when you that's something else you look at, is where the planet's moving direct or where they retrograde, that makes a difference in terms of how they work. And sometimes transits only peak one time, but it's not at all uncommon that a transit peaks three times. When I say peak, it comes into influence, it builds an influence like a bell curve. The peak is the date at which it's the most intense and then the bell curve starts to ebb away. That can happen one time or three times. It never happens twice, because if it happens twice, it means it's because it's retrograde, then at some point it goes direct. So it's either once or three times. And that's fairly common with transits, and that's why certain Pluto transits can last up to three years if it happens to peak three times. On very rare occasions, it can peak five times. That's pretty uncommon, but it does happen. So that's the retrograde okay. movement. It both indicates something psychologically and it's the explanation for why some transits occur more than once. Okay. And void of course? Void of course, I don't work with, so I can't even really okay. tell you, but it's, where, it's in that kind of void time where it's, it's kind of in between the direct okay. and the retrograde. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I was trying to, because I've heard like the term the moon being void, of course, a lot. So yeah. I was just wondering what that was. Well, we're out of time, but I thank you all for your interest and your attention. It was kind of fun to get to substitute in at the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I do hope to see some of you in the future, and thanks and good luck. RVML Resource Center is a volunteer-operated federal 501c3 tax-exempt nonprofit organization. RVML is dedicated to providing easy access to a comprehensive collection of information on a variety of metaphysical, spiritual, and personal development subjects. RVML accepts and appreciates all donations. Material and monetary contributions are fully tax-deductible. This recording is not copyrighted and permission is granted to broadcast, exhibit, or duplicate all or part of this program for non-commercial educational purposes. This live presentation was organized and presented by the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library and Event Center. For more information, please visit rvml.org.